Burn Survivors, and Phoenix Society's marketing team, Amber Wilcox and Rachel Anderson. Hello, welcome to episode two of Girls with Graphs, a Burn Community podcast. I'm Rachel Anderson, and I'm joined by my co-host, Amber Wilcox, and we are so excited to be back here with our community, um, and we have two very special guests joining us today. Yeah, um, super so I'm, excited. Yeah, I'm so excited for these guests, um, so I'm going to quickly introduce them. Um, first, we have Lorraine Carley, who is the Vice President of Outreach and Advocacy for NFPA, where she oversees all media and public affairs activities, the organization's magazine, NFPA Journal, NFPA's Wildfire Public Education, Community Risk Reduction, and Regional Operation Divisions. And on top of all that, she also serves on Phoenix Society's Board of Directors. She's also the president of the Home Fire Sprinkler Coalition, the president of the Electric Safety Foundation International, and is a member of the Board of Directors for the Nation National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Thanks, for Lorraine, for joining us today. Thank you. I'm sorry to make it take so long. Boy. <laughs> Lorraine, you're a busy lady. <laughs> yeah, but once I heard that, I said, wow, no wonder I don't have a lot of time on my calendar. Well, but thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be with you today. Yes. We're so and, happy to have you. Yep. And Lorraine is also joined with by Russell Levitt, um, who has 38 plus years of experience in the fire production industry. He currently serves as the executive chairman and board member for Telgian Holdings Incorporated, as well as the chairman of Telgian Corporation. He is also active in numerous trade and professional associations and holds several leadership positions, including the chair of NFPA. NFPA's board of directors. So thank you, Russ, for joining us today as well. Oh, thank you. It's a privilege and uh, honor to, to participate. And uh, I just want to say, you know, 38 years, that makes me by far the oldest okay, <laughs> in this group. So, uh, 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 but seriously, I'm, uh, uh, it's an honor to participate today. Thank you. Old but wise, right? That's right. Wise beyond his years. Well, and you did forget in, in your introduction, one of the other claims to fame that both Russ and I have is we are golfing companions. Anytime we happen to be in the same place where there's a golf course. So that's awesome. Yeah. That. That's Fun right. fact. And, that's right. And and Lorraine has to dodge my <laughs> we don't have to go there, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, before we get started, we also want to send over a special thank you to our season one podcast sponsor, Pritzker Hagman. Thank them for making this possible for all of us today as well. Awesome. Well, uh, Rachel, I uh, I want to first get started with kind of talking about NFPA. I know. Uh, we have both of you here, and I know Phoenix Society very much knows who NFPA is and is very near and dear to our hearts, but we want to share with all of our podcast listeners out there. So the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA, is an international nonprofit organization devoted to eliminating death, injury, property, and economic loss due to fire, electrical, and related hazards. But Lorraine, we'd love in your own words to tell us a little bit about what you do with NFPA, if it's okay with you and don't mind sharing with us today. Sure. So NFPA is actually, we just celebrated last year, 125th anniversary. So that's kind of a huge milestone because a lot of people aren't really very familiar with the National Fire Protection Association. They're probably more familiar with some of the aspects of what we do. Um, we're really an information and knowledge provider, and we deliver that information and knowledge through codes and standards. And then that makes people glaze over when we start to talk about codes <laughs> and standards. But the reality is anywhere you go, whether it's in your home or in your workplace or somewhere that you frequent, like a mall or a movie theater, there's the impact of NFPA codes and standards. I always say to people, the reasons that exit doors push out is predicated on NFPA codes and standards because that makes you more apt to be able to escape if there's a fire. Things like smoke alarms and sprinklers, all of those are predicated by NFPA codes and standards. And so we influence a lot of safety across the world. 
but we also do research on the fire problem so that we can tell people what the main causes of fires are. That way we can work to prevent those fires. We do tons of public education, uh, particularly around those major causes of fires. Sparky, the fire dog people are probably more familiar with than NFPA, um, but we do all kinds of safety information related to, as you say, fire, life, and electrical safety. And we've been doing that for 125 years. And as there are new fire challenges, we update and we adapt so that we're providing the public with the information that they need to keep themselves and their families safe from fire. That's awesome. Lorraine, I don't think I knew all of that about all of the codes and things. You know, I go to movie theaters and stuff all the time and push those doors out. And so now I'm never going to be able to push out a door without thinking, without thinking, of thinking NFPA. about it. Yeah. The, the other one I always tell people about is the reason that there are doors beside a revolving door. You know, we're all used to yes. walking through revolving doors. But not too long ago, probably 75 years or so ago, revolving doors didn't have those doors beside them. So you can imagine if there is a fire in that building and everybody's trying to get out through mm -hmm. a revolving door, how quickly that would stack up. Um, mm. And that was a big case in one of these famous fires, the Coconut Grove nightclub in Boston, which I think is a little over 75 years ago. That was the issue and an outgrowth of that fire was that the code started to require additional doors beside those so that you have more ways for people to get out in an emergency. So one of the big things that NFPA codes and standards do is that they're able to learn from some of these tragedies of how we can enhance codes and standards and enhance public education so that we can continue to make people safer um, from both the hazards that we know about and all of these emerging hazards that maybe we'll get a chance to talk about as well. Yes, we definitely want to get to talking about that, but I'm going to turn it over to Rachel. Uh, mm. Rachel has a co question for Russ here today, too. Yeah, so obviously we know Telgian's in the fire industry as well, and they're a worldwide provider of comprehensive fire security, life safety, consulting, testing, inspections, engineering, design services, a ton of things that go on often behind the scenes, like Lorraine was saying, that people don't necessarily realize in their day to day. So Russ, could you just tell us a little bit more about what exactly Telgian does? Well, you pretty well summed it up. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, we, um, you know, uh, the founders of Telgen, uh, two of the founders were actually um, retired fire marshals. And uh, fire marshals in the, in the public realm are deeply involved in, in the life safety and fire safety and all the things that come with that. And they wanted to take that experience and knowledge they have and share that um, with the private sector and, and influence what uh, companies do and organizations and things to support and promote. Because um, often what happens is that um, uh, fire and life safety can, from the, from the private sector point of view, can be kind, kind of become a checklist, right? It's like, well, we need to do these things so that I can uh, open my building and I can occupy the facility that we're trying to occupy. And they don't always think about um, the reasons behind it and why they're doing some of these things and why they're required. I mean, it was interesting because uh, Lorraine talked about the revolving doors. I was uh, I just returned Friday uh, from Europe, and uh, and uh, when she mentioned that, I was thinking about the hotel I was staying at in uh, in Paris and it had the revolving door and it had the doors to the side mm -hmm. and. Uh, uh, you know, uh, I, I thought about the influence of NFPA um, on not just what happens uh, here at home, but globally, um, because everywhere I go, even though NFPA may not be formally recognized and all their standards and the codes that have evolved from there are used literally worldwide. And uh, it was funny, my wife uh, had a, uh, she loves her NFPA baseball cap and uh, she was wearing her, her ball cap we were in uh, Normandy uh, uh, in the Normandy area of France and an individual came up and said I know NFPA wow so she, you know, <laughs> you're wearing the NFPA hat and she said I'm so excited to see somebody uh, with that so it started a whole conversation 
but yeah, it's, um, uh, you know, our company, we talk about the fact that uh, uh, we really do focus on, uh, on not just compliance to the law, but in, in doing the right thing and helping educate um, our customers um, why we do these things um, so it becomes more than just a checklist so that I can uh, I can uh, get my building permit or my occupancy. And uh, mm-hmm. we, we take a lot of pride in doing that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, and you kind of brought up a good point about education. And that's exactly mm-hmm. why we're here today with the both of you, because um, National Fire Prevention Week is coming up. It's going to be October 9th through 15th this year. Um, and it's really exciting because we're actually celebrating the 100th year of National Fire Prevention Week. So Lorraine, could you just tell us a little bit more about the history um, behind the week and what it stands for? Sure. As you said, we're excited to be celebrating the 100th anniversary. It's actually the longest public health observance in the country. So that's a that's a pretty cool thing. Uh, but the Fire Prevention Week, it is. It's, it's incredible. And we'll talk a little bit about the history, which is that it always uh, falls in the week that's the anniversary of the Great Chicago Fire, because Mm. everybody remembers or has heard something, whether it's real or the story of Mrs. O'Leary's cows. Everybody's familiar with the with the story and the legend of the Great Chicago Fire. But it's a great way for us to tie prevention activities to something that is so commonplace in history. So that's why it's always celebrated um, during the week that encompasses that anniversary. And we see now that a lot of uh, organizations actually celebrate fire prevention all month during October. Mm -hmm. There's various activities. Uh, But sometimes you look at something and say, well, it's 100 years old, so do we really still need to be doing that? Uh, The reality is today it's more important than ever because we see new challenges with fire. And while we have made lots of progress in reducing the number of fires and fire deaths, for example, we used to see about 8,000 deaths a year in home fires. Today, that number is about 2,500 to 3,000. That's Mm. terrific progress, but we're actually seeing that number of fire deaths tick up um, over the last couple of years. And what we're seeing behind that is today's fires burn hotter and faster than Mm. previous years, and particularly in homes. And that's because if you think about the things that are in our homes today compared to maybe our grandparents or our great grandparents, um, they burn faster. You know, you used Mm -hmm. to have heavy um, upholstered furniture and big wooden legs. And today, most of the (laughs) things that are in our homes are synthetics like polyester that burn really fast. And Mm. we also see homes built a little bit differently uh, with open floor plans and lots of space. So that's a lot of air that circulates if there's a fire. So between the the Mm. things we put in our homes and the way we build our homes, the fires are faster. Um, It used to be that if your smoke alarm went off, you might have seven, eight, maybe 10 minutes to escape. Today, we tell people that you could have as little as two minutes to get out. That means you could have to move fast uh, in order to get out. And that really is the premise behind this year's theme for Fire Prevention Week. Every year, in addition to this year, we have our 100th anniversary as part of the theme. But uh, every year, we also have a very action-oriented theme to ask the public to engage in learning more and doing something. So this year, it's Fire Won't Wait, Plan Your Escape. Because that fire, if should you have a fire, it's going to roll through very fast. So we want to make sure that everybody is planning and practicing uh, an escape plan in their home. So that if something happens, everybody knows what to do and they can react quickly. And Lorraine, I, I think about that two minutes, right? And like, I think of what can I do accomplish in two minutes? Not much. Not right? a lot. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if I can get to my door right in two yeah. minutes some days. So, yeah. Uh, and that's... one of the, one of the I think that's a really good point because, and I think a lot of people think, well, I'll be able to get out of my house. I walk out the door every single day, probably several times a day. I know the way from my living room to the front door, my bedroom to the to the stairs. But in reality, when that home fills with black, thick smoke, 
you would be amazed at how difficult it can be to get out of a home. And those, what we're also seeing is that that smoke can be very toxic this, these days because some of the things that might be burning in your home are, are plastic and electronics and they give off a very thick, black, toxic smoke. So you've got to be able to get out fast. So, you know, we tell people as you're planning and practicing, actually practice with a stopwatch. How, how fast would it take you to get from the furthest point in your home to the front door? How fast would it take you to get to a window? Because we tell people that you want to be identifying two ways out of every room. And one of those might be a window. So you could very quickly maybe get to a window if your main exit is blocked. So mm -hmm. you have to think about a lot of things. But if you think about them and plan with everybody in your household ahead of time, you're increasing that likelihood that when the smoke alarm sounds, you're going to very calmly, quickly be able to do what you need to do to get out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I yeah, want to touch on one thing that, uh, that Lorraine uh, uh, talked about that I think that's really important as, as this all evolves, because we are seeing so many different products, different methods mm -hmm. of doing things. And what's interesting is that often things that solve one problem create another. Mm -hmm. So we look at like um, um, all of the move towards uh, non combustion type engines and, and things for uh, uh, to, to protect the climate, right? And we have lithium batteries and, and, and things. And mm -hmm. so, Lithium batteries are solved certainly and help create uh, uh, an opportunity to do things that we couldn't do before, but they also create a fire issue uh, that, that no one thinks about unless you're in that arena. Or um, uh, building, we, uh, building cladding, insulations and things that we use that, you know, to help uh, um, lower energy costs uh, can also create a fire hazard that has to be addressed. And so it's a constant, evolving, almost moving target. Um, everything from, uh, like Lorraine said, what we are using in our homes for furniture and covering things that create a fire challenge um, uh, to things that we deal with every day um, outside of our homes. And, and it is a constant moving target. Because um, there's, as we solve one problem, we often create another that someone needs to look at, um, so that we don't uh, uh, create a, a a hazard that we were uh, unex not expecting or that was unintended. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because I talked about NFPA being 125 years old, and really what we have to make sure is we love progress as a society. We love new things that make our lives easier and more efficient. We just want to make sure that make, that safety is progressing alongside with those new things. Right. And, you know, I learned a new term about a week ago, which was um, micro mobility items. And mm -hmm. I actually thought they were just those scooters and the e-bikes, but they're actually called micro mobility items. And they're being charged with lithium ion batteries, like so mm -hmm. many of the things that we have around our house. And that is creating a whole new hazard that we didn't have a few years ago. Uh, we actually worked um, just in the last few weeks with FDNY and UL Solutions to, to talk about, bring people together about this new hazard because a lot of times people don't know, as Russ says, they don't, they don't know what the risks are to these new things that mm -hmm. they think are really helpful to them, and they are. But, for example, you bring an e-scooter into your home and you plug it in, and then you might plug it in in your hallway. And now if there's a fire associated with that lithium ion battery, not only do you have a fire in your home, you've blocked your exit, exit right. with your e-scooter. Or if you right. have a fire somewhere else in your house and you've blocked your exit. And what we are learning and we continue to learn more about lithium ion batteries is that those fires happen really, really fast. Mm. Uh, they're in, they can be incredibly uh, big fires and difficult to extinguish. So learning more about them and then what are the right safety tips to to share with the public with um, as as we move forward and and have all of those things around lorraine i something you said right really resonated with me when you said you know you see you've seen fires go up or, or like the awareness of yeah. of what they are and i think 
for me as a burn survivor, when I was burned, I didn't understand. I don't think at all what a burn injury was until I sat in that seat and neither did my husband. Right. And what somebody that has dealt with a burn goes through. And I can only imagine, you know, with today's technology and, and just how we're kind of constantly distracted by everything around us, how that also impacts it. Right. And so I feel like, especially with, with fire growing up, that was something that we always talked about in school and yeah. educated. But as I became an adult, right, that wasn't a, not a priority, but not something yeah. I looked at or, or paid attention to. And so even just this podcast, right, I think it's important that we talk about yeah. or we have a conversation about fire safety yeah. uh, because it's not something that we think about even just in our everyday lives, right? I, and I think every, you raise a really valid point. In fact, I had a discussion with a reporter uh, just today about this very issue is because we've done such a good job of bringing the number of fires down, there is a sense of complacency out there. People think, mm -hmm. I'm not gonna, I'll, I'll never have a fire in my house. And if I do, I'll be able to get out quick. Um, it's not gonna happen to me. That's something that happens to somebody else. Um, so we do need to keep educating people. The other thing that was interesting about this discussion I had with a reporter where she was saying, well, I suppose you'd need to do escape planning in your home with kids because they're probably not very good at learning about fire safety. But what we find is young children, particularly we start to educate them in preschool. So kids between about the ages of three and eight or nine are very receptive to fire safety messages. And they're really good deliverers of the message because <laughs> they go home and they tell their parents or their caretakers, they say, hey, you know, we learned about smoke alarms today. Where are our smoke alarms? Do we have smoke alarms? Well, look, I brought home this escape plan for us to do as homework. So children, and then as we kind of get to those teenage years, we're really not thinking about it. Young adults, we're really not thinking about it. We get to older adults. In fact, older adults are one of the highest risk of um, fire uh, injuries. So we try to then re-educate them, but we need to start to continue that education throughout the whole kind of your, your life. And, you know, when parents, then you'll become a parent and you start to to say, oh, I've got to go back to what I learned as a kid and make sure that we're doing some of those things. I remember when I first came to NFPA, I said to people, I, this never had as much meaning until I came to NFPA is that my father always told us where our meeting place was outside and it was on the neighbor's front steps across mm -hmm. the street. And that was just drilled into us all the time. Mm -hmm. And I never knew the significance of that until I came to NFPA. Mm -hmm. That's so true. Speaking yeah. of, of fire escape plans and, and educating children, you, uh, NFPA has great resources on their website. I was combing through before this podcast. And so I wanted to put one up on the screen, but Lorraine, I'm hoping you can talk to, to our listeners about what it's like to create a fire escape plan. So I have an example I'm going to show up here on the screen. Sure. Uh, but That's do you want to talk a little bit one. about this? <laughs> it is a beautiful one. <laughs> That's a beautiful one that looks like a couple of floors of somebody's house. And what and we have these available on our website, nfpa.org or firepreventionweek.org that families can download. Or you can just draw out the floor plan on your home. And what this does is it identifies every room in your home and those little red lines are two ways out of each room we tell people again to identify two ways out of each room whether it's a door or a window um, where the stairwells are how to get down um, and sometimes uh, we also tell people to make an x on here where are all of your smoke alarms because you need smoke alarms on every level of your home inside each bedroom <coughs> and outside each sleeping area and a lot of times people they might have one smoke alarm or a couple of smoke alarms, but you need to make sure that you have them in all places because if, and you wanna make sure they're interconnected. That way, if one sounds, for example, there's a fire in your basement, that smoke alarm goes off, it will trigger the rest of the alarms to go off so they're, they can be heard throughout the house. Um, so we ask people to sit down with every member of your family and make sure everybody knows what they've identified as the, the two ways out of each room. And then outside of the house on this uh, one, we have a little tree outside, which is the family meeting place. Everybody's going to go to that spot so that they can be accounted for. Um, and when the fire department shows up, they'll ask who's ever out there is like, is everybody out? Is everybody here? Because if you're in the home and you've gotten out, 
don't go back in. Call the fire department from the outside, alert them to there's a fire, they will come and help you out. But this is great. This is a great resource mm -hmm. for folks and they can either use the ones on our website um, or just draw out their own floor plan at home. Yeah, we'll put that in our podcast uh, notes as well so that listeners can grab that resource or any other ones on your website as well. Great. Thanks, Lorraine. Yeah. Yeah, and you, you talked about marking those smoke alarm, those spots. Yeah. How, what's, how many are we supposed to have? Yeah. Should we have one in every room? <laughs> yeah. Where yeah. do they all go? <laughs> exactly. You know, and everybody's home is different. So I can't say you'll need six or you'll need seven. But what you do need is you need one on every level of your home. So if that's the basement, the first floor, the second floor, the attic, um, and then you need them inside each bedroom and outside each sleeping area. So you might have three bedrooms on your second floor. So you'll have one in each bedroom and then one in the hallway outside of those sleeping areas. So four there. Uh, but you want to make sure that you have enough smoke alarms. Um, tragically, what we see is that the majority of fire deaths happen in homes that either have no smoke alarms are no working smoke alarms. So the big tip there is to make sure that you have the right amount of smoke alarms, that you're checking them regularly, and that they're all working. You know, check those batteries. We, we have that all the time. Uh, thankfully, technology has emerged in this area as well. We now have what they call long life batteries and smoke alarms that are good for about 10 years. Uh, so you have to worry less about them, but you still want to make sure mm -hmm. that you're checking to make sure that uh, they're in good working order. Mm -hmm. And how often should you check smoke alarms, uh, Lorraine? Every so, month. Yeah, you can. You month. should check them every month. Uh, I think even on our website, we might have a little calendar so you can make sure you do it. I think there are apps. You can put it on your own calendar. You can put it on your own uh, reminder alerts on your watch. You know, there's all kinds of ways or, you know, get everybody in the house engaged in that, like with a little sticker on the refrigerator that the kids can check off. Did we check our smoke alarms this month? Uh, there's lots of ways to, to keep, uh, keep it in mind. That's mm -hmm. awesome. I don't think I... You know, prior to coming to work for Phoenix Society, I don't think my I myself knew right yeah. how often to check my smoke alarms. So right. um, that's a great fact that you know, an, an easy way to help prevent, right? Yeah, and don't feel bad, you know, because we do lots of surveys, and most people don't know the answers to some of these questions, like how often do I check my smoke alarm? Where do I need them? Uh, and that's why we do uh, a lot of public education and we work with partners like the Phoenix Society to make sure uh, that we're all talking about this, not only during October, but throughout the year, because, mm -hmm. you know, even though uh, Fire Prevention Week is October, we are actually heading into the season where we do see uh, more fires this time of year between holidays and cooking and colder weather and heating related fires. So if we get as we get into the December, January, February, uh, those are some of the unfortunate prime months for for home fires. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's the, you know, the, the interesting thing when you look at what Lorraine's talking about here, if you look at the mission of NFPA, which a big part of that, right, is the elimination of injuries and death and things that Virtually all of this is preventable. You know, there are many things that happen to us. I used to look like Sean Connery, I tell people. You know, Lorraine, <laughs> you know, I did. You know, I, I had something happen. I developed an infection, and it just happened. The doctors, you know, there was no way to prevent it. And, and the things that, you know, uh, have changed my life and stuff. But I think about, you know, fire. And, and, and burn victims and all the, the things that happen with that, it is preventable, to, you know, if, if we just have to create that awareness. And that's tough because for most of us, um, fire is not a real thing, right? It, it, you know, we like Lorraine said, we've done such a good job of reaching a level of, uh, of uh, protection that we have now that it, that for most of us, we don't think about it until it actually happens yeah. or happens to somebody that's close to us. Mm. But if we if we can raise that awareness, you know, um, you know, we could prevent. I mean, you know, what is an acceptable number? Is twenty five hundred home fire deaths and the hundreds of thousands of injuries associated? Well, is that acceptable? And uh, 
And I think we'd all agree, no. And it's yeah. funny when you compare that to other things, you know, uh, I mean, uh, the same number of people that die in home fires, for example, might be the equivalent of 15, you know, jet airliners crashing in a year. And, and, and that's become unacceptable, right? We would not accept even one crashing. We, uh, you know, we, we react very vigilantly. We need to create that same, same type of reaction to something that, uh, you know, is certainly far more common and far more devastating. And that's the challenge that we lie at. Uh, that, that, that is before us. And uh, NFPA is a, is a big, big part of that, but can't do it alone. Yeah. We right. need all the help um, uh, that we can get in getting this uh, message out there uh, and preventing these things from happening. Yeah, and that's right, Russ, because like you say, sometimes it's very simple actions that will prevent fires. If we think about some of the leading causes of fire, cooking is the leading cause of fire. And the most uh, common cause of those cooking fires is unattended cooking. So mm. people get distracted, they go change the TV station, they go to answer the phone, they look at their social media, you know, and then that small amount of time, you've got something on the stovetop, maybe you've got something too close to the stovetop that can burn, and then you have a fire. So mm. there's very simple things, you know, pay attention to what you're cooking, make sure the area that you're, cl you're cooking ha is free of, whether it's paper towels or a dish towel or food right. wrapping. So there are very simple ways to prevent the vast majority of these fires. And Russ is is right. And you know, sometimes people take it for granted because they haven't seen it happen to them or in their family. And the other point I wanted to bring up that Russ was talking about is, you know, NFPA can't do it alone. And, and that's why we work with so many different organizations and individuals. Uh, I've been at NFPA now for almost 17 years. And I think I met Amy almost immediately, Amy Acton, um, head of the Phoenix <laughs> Society. And, you know, everybody that knows Amy, when you work with Amy, that passion she exudes is contagious. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we started talking about how do we engage more people in prevention? And I'm so proud of the work that we've done together with burn survivors of having them talk and tell their stories to other people, to have them tell their stories to policymakers so that mm. we can impact change so that there are few, in the future, there are much fewer bird survivors because you know we don't have fires and first responders that get injured in fires. We wanna reduce those numbers. So it does, it takes all of us, whether it's corporations like, like Russ's and organizations like the Phoenix Society and so many others. Um, NFPA uh, champions this notion called the, the fire and life safety ecosystem, which is a bunch of cogs, eight cogs that, are, that work together. And it's everything from policymakers establishing the right regulatory framework around fire and life safety um, to using and enforcing the codes and standards and the most up-to-date codes and standards. It's making sure that our first responders are well-prepared and well-trained um, to help in these events. And one of the key components is an informed public, because if the public has the right information, they're more apt to take action for their own safety. If they don't think it's going to happen to them or they don't know how to um, prevent a fire, then we're sort of left with what we have. And we really, um, that informed public is a key piece of that safety ecosystem and mm. protecting themselves and, and their families. Yeah, you spend a half hour with Amy Acton and I, yeah. I, I get to spend, you know, one of my first weeks here, I'm fairly new and I get yeah. to spend some time with Amy as, you know, a fellow burn survivor. Yeah. Uh, it's always nice to kind of connect with somebody who's she's she's been around the block as a burn survivor and she kind yeah. of knows the ropes here. And so I can't agree well, more. Yeah. And, and the other thing that's so great, uh, not only Amy, but so many of, of you at the Phoenix Society, whether it's the staff or the survivors that that I work with, it's like 
they bring so many people to the table by telling their story and they they have that similar contagious personality of like we can change things it doesn't have to be like that um one of the things that we work with the phoenix society on is a initiative called faces of fire um and because i think amber you said in the beginning is that when you became a burn survivor, it doesn't just impact you, it impacts your family, your friends. But anytime there is a fire, there's a whole bunch of things that are impacted. It's the businesses in that community, it's the teachers, it's other kids at school. Everybody feels that impact of fire. So that's what we're trying to reduce, but we're also kind of leveraging that community to be able to make people safer and maybe um, prevent some of these from, from happening. Yeah, I think that's what's so important about sharing our story, right? I know Absolutely. right after my burn injury, I started sharing my story on social media. And to me, it wasn't about you know getting the attention of, of who I was, but getting the attention of this is what happened to me and I don't want this to happen to you as well. And and I think a lot of survivors can resonate with that, right? Sharing your story is yep. about a bigger cause. And, I can't tell you how many people would reach out, right? And say, oh my gosh, I'm never going to have my kids in the kitchen again after yeah. what happened to you. And, yeah. and it's true, right? It takes, it takes until you know someone and get to know them yeah. and see what they're going through, I think, to realize, oh my gosh, I don't want that to happen to me. And, right. and it can yeah. be tough. Yeah. It can be tough to, to realize that that's what it takes, but to know that we're real people and that those things can happen. So yeah. Russ, yeah. I want to take a minute and, and touch on Tell Jan, because you are one of our partners too here at Phoenix Society. And um, I, I was looking into a little bit about how you help the community from this from this aspect. And you know, there's so much that Telgian does, supports crisis management, emergency preparedness. But I, I took, a, took a moment and saw that you had a lot of lunch and learns too, right? To educate communities and, and, and consultation. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what Telgian does and uh, to educate the community about how you can help specifically um, I saw a lot about how you can help businesses with workplace safety too, right? It's not just about the home, but it's also about mm -hmm. where you work. And with all of us going back into work, you know, or going back into the office, that can be important to educate others on. Yeah, no question about it. I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, we spend most of us spend a lot of time at work, <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, even in today's world, we we, we do that. And if we're not at work, we are visiting places of business, right? We're we're at the store, we're at the gym, we're uh, you know wherever, and and, uh, and and just like at home, you know, it's easy to become very complacent. Um, and uh, and and as business owners, you know, there's an interesting statistic because um, we've been involved for. We founded the company, I tell people, we founded and built the company on the big box explosion. When we talk about big boxes, you know, as big box of retail, right? With the put up four walls and a ceiling and fill the building full of stuff and and uh, and they will come, the shoppers will come. And, uh, you know, but what's interesting is actuarially, you know, statistically, a typical big box like a Walmart or a Target or a Kroger grocery store will have a fire that grows large enough to activate a fire sprinkler once every 150 years. Wow. So it doesn't happen very often. So it's very easy to just ignore the fact that that risk is there. But however, if you turn that statistic into numbers and you look at some of, you know, you said, okay, if I had 4,000 locations around the country, that means every year I could have 30 to 40 fires that would grow large enough that it would activate my fire protection systems. That sounds different, right? Than once every 150 years. And, uh, and so a big part of what we've been trying to do um, is that education piece on the commercial side uh, in terms of having a plan in place, making sure that that uh, uh, the uh, uh, employees and such that work in the building 
though we are fire extinguishers are, know how to use those. What are the exits? What are the egress plans? How do I react? What are the steps I take if a fire is discovered? Because if you talk to most people, for instance, they would say, well, I'm going to run and grab a fire extinguisher. That's the first thing you do. No, that's not the first thing. <laughs> okay. The first thing you do is that you clear the area, you notify, okay, mm -hmm. um, the responders that there's, and then you take action, okay, because you don't want to stop the, 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 the evacuation process or the notification process or the response of those that are trained while you're trying to um, extinguish a fire that you may or may not be able to, and you lose yeah. all those valuable time right yeah. so that, it makes so much sense but that's your first instinct right and that would be mine too until you said that i would have been like i'll just go get the fire extinguisher right. <laughs> exactly exactly right and and to to the point we were talking about earlier these fires now with some of the materials and things grow so fast and so quickly that if i do not um initiate a response or help that happen immediately, it can quickly uh, get out of control. And okay. uh, and so it's, you know, knowing those sorts of things, the proper steps to take are, are critical. Um, and we really do, when you think about when you go to a place and you visit a place, you go to a movie theater, you go someplace, we really do depend on the uh, uh, our hosts, so to speak, right? to help if something were to happen, okay? Mm. That's who we look to, and that's who we need to make sure are trained so that they know the proper reaction uh, when an emergency does occur. So, um, yeah, through lunch and learns, through um, uh, 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 flyers, through education, through uh, all of those things, uh, that, that's a big part. Because, look, I've been involved in most of my career on the suppression side or the notification side, the best the best thing we can do is prevent absolutely happening in the first place. But recognizing that stuff does happen, right? Then what do we do to make sure that we protect, you know, um, our guests and those that are in these facilities where an emergency occurs? So. Yeah. We take great pride in our work in that area. And one of the reasons why I think I was really attracted to NFPA was NFPA's work and all of the tools that they have to help with that education. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah, like we said, NFPA's website has so many tools, so many, you know, you can print out and draw your own escape route. Uh -huh. um, so many great resources. So I also kind of wanted to go back to escape planning for a yeah. second. And I know we had that map up. We talked about, you know, opening or going out windows. So uh -huh. that's one thing you don't always think about is opening the windows and making sure they're easily open. Yeah. What are some other key areas in that escape planning we need to be mindful of? One of the big things is making sure that your exits aren't blocked. So, mm -hmm. uh, you know, w everybody seems to be a little fascinated. There are TV shows about hoarders and stuff. But <laughs> if you have a lot of clutter in your house and you can't get from the living room to that doorway, that's going to slow down your escape or even prevent you from escaping. And it mm. also adds literally fuel to the fire if you've got a lot of clutter in your home. Mm -hmm. um, and somebody sent me something in the in the mail when I was at my office a couple of weeks ago. And they said, you know, one of the things that you should use as an education point is you know, this person was a former firefighter. It's like if the firefighter can't get in your house, you probably can't get out. So mm. if you've got so much clutter, whether it's in your garage or you just have a lot of stuff in your hallway that people have to climb over, that's going to make it very difficult. So mm. that's one really big, important thing, Rachel, to think about on your escape plan. It is, is you know, do you have bars on your windows that you can't easily open or, mm. uh, you know, you make sure that you, that you have the kind that will release quickly from the inside so that you can can escape. And you're right, people don't often think of the windows as being their secondary way of exit. But in reality, if, if your main exit is blocked, 
that's often the place that if you can get the window up and the fire department is out there, that is going to be uh, the logical means of, of getting out. The other thing just around that escape planning and, and education is a lot of times, sadly, we see that children get frightened and they go into a closet. You want to make sure that you know, that's a big education point of like, don't hide from a fire, practice your escape plan. And if you have uh, little kids in the home, who's going to be in charge of going and get that, getting that child out of the crib or helping a young child? Similarly, if you have people in your home with mobility issues, what's the plan? And have you talked to your fire department about how you would get somebody else out of the home that might have mobility issues or, or other issues? Um, you know, if, if you have people in the, your home with, with hearing issues, there are bed shaker alarms that would mm -hmm. be able to notify them because they might not hear the alarm. Uh, there's lots of studies uh, you hear from time to time of people saying that children won't hear a smoke alarm um, just because of the decibels. So um, mm. when you're practicing that escape plan, uh, actually setting off your test alarm mm -hmm. to see mm. whether or not kids would, yeah. would hear it when they're sleeping. So you want to try and think about every aspect of what you would need to do in the event of a fire so that you plan for it. We, we always feel better when, when we plan for something as opposed to having, as Russ said, something just sort of happen to you. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I remember as a kid, my dad and mom would set off our alarm at random times and test me and my sister to see if we followed the plan. And most yeah. of the time we were pretty successful, but that's it, why it's so important to practice. It is. It really is. And get, get that's everybody amazing. engaged. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 And and you mentioned the, the website. Uh, so in addition to NFPA's website, Sparky the Fire Dog has his own website. <laughs> Um, so you can visit his website as well, which is sparky.org. And he, he really makes learning fire safety fun because he's got a lot of games on there that are, can you get Sparky out of the house? You know, and it's a little video game. So there are things like that. And there's more uh, downloadable activities that teachers and families can use. Uh, so lots of uh, good resources and fun videos that really make the learning easy for kids and, and parents can entertain their kids while hopefully they're learning something about safety. Yeah, when we make it fun, learning is easy, right? So. Exactly. That, that, that's the key. You know, in, in very short attention spans these days, everything's got to be video based and moving and interactive and games. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we have a fantastic public education team at NFPA that's always adding new resources to uh, the Fire Prevention Week website as well as, as Sparky's. Yeah, and, and, and the fun applies no matter how old you are. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. exactly. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> In the attention span thing applies. Yeah. <laughs> we all have shorter attention span these days. You know, one of the things that I experienced firsthand that, that Lorraine mentioned, uh, when we uh, when we moved to uh, Phoenix, we my wife and I had lived in San Diego for 20 years. And then uh, we, uh, we went to Phoenix. And, of course, that July, she's going, now tell me again why we <laughs> when it was 190 degrees or whatever. Oh, my but, gosh. Yeah. Um, she really wanted to have a basement. Now, if you're familiar with that area of the country, there's not very many basements, but she wanted to have a basement because she was thinking about if the, if the uh, uh, air conditioning ever failed or we lost power, you know, the basement could be cooler. And, and we didn't mm -hmm. find a home. And it was interesting because one of the things that I uh, saw immediately was from a security standpoint, they had put bars over all of the window wells going down mm -hmm. the basement. So they were trying to solve one problem, right, a security yeah. issue, and then created a life safety Another issue right. because they took away that exit um, out of the basement. So you only had the stairwell. And if yeah. that stairwell was not available, there was no other way out of the uh, basement. So uh, like Lorraine said, you know, we have to make sure that we're looking at the whole picture. We try to solve one problem, creates another unintended yeah. uh, consequence. Yeah. And I'm sure that's a challenge, right? Because I know I think about just for my own safety, right? We are worried about people getting into our house, but then if we can't get out, we can't right? get out. Right. Yeah. I know I was staying at an Airbnb last a couple of weeks ago and we 
discovered like a safety issue, right? Where we tried to get out onto a deck and we'd get locked out if we ended up outside on a deck. And so it made me think of like, you kind of have this weird trade-off between mm -hmm. security, but then mm -hmm. fire safety at some point too of, okay, I can't get in, but then can the, the person with the fire get out, right? right. So it's this Yeah, this and so that's why really kind of knowing your environment and thinking about all of these things. Yeah, that's really, yeah. really important. And how do you overcome that challenge even, Lorraine or Russ, like when you have those issues, right? Of like, okay, but I need to secure something. So I, I guess there's right technologies and whatnot out there that can yeah, there, provide there's, that. Yeah, there's newer technologies, newer yep. um, equipment that has updated safety features. So like, for example, bars on windows, there are ones that you can open from the in, take them off from the inside, but you couldn't get into them from the outside. Um, so you want to make sure, you know, it's similar. We see, unfortunately, a lot of space heater fires. And sometimes it's because people have older space heaters. But if you look for some newer equipment that has the benefit of updated technology, things like if it tips over, it will automatically shut off. Mm -hmm. Or if a blanket gets tossed over it, it will automatically shut off. So um, there are all the technology pieces, again, making sure that the technology keeps pace with what we need in safety. Um, and I think, you know, manufacturers do a pretty good job of, you know, t advancing safety as they're thinking about how to incorporate new technology. Um, and that benefits us all. We just have to be thinking about it from, from that angle. And not everybody thinks about it from that angle. Mm -hmm. No, and until you said that, we have hurricane shutters, right? It's hurricane yes. season here in Florida. And well, we block up all of our windows. <laughs> but yeah. at some point, you know, my husband and I left our back door, right, as an, op an exit and we have our front door. But, you know, thinking about that, I'm thinking, okay, that's something even that does probably cause some concern of having when you're blocking off your windows that stops your exit, right? Yeah. From the and, and how are they on? Could you push them out if you had to? Right, 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 yeah. right. Those are are good conversations. Well, speaking of seasons, I know you mentioned it earlier, but we're coming up and, and we have a few minutes left here, but the holiday season's upon us. So uh, what are just a couple ways that you recommend with the holiday season uh, yeah. as you're preparing? Yeah. Well, as I mentioned earlier, cooking is the leading cause of home fires and holidays are here. So we've got Thanksgiving and winter holidays and a lot of cooking going on, a lot of guests in the home. So the, uh, the distractions as well. So you want to make sure you're paying attention to what you're cooking. You know, we introduce candles during many holidays. So that's another thing to be careful about and making sure that if you leave the room that the candles are out. Um, and a lot of is the colder weather, people are uh, sparking up their fireplaces and their wood stoves for the first time. So you want to make sure that those are in good working order because we see an awful lot of fires that are associated with um, that substance that builds up in chimneys, that what's mm -hmm. called creosote. Uh, that's usually what's catching fire there. So making sure that it's cleaned properly and it's in good working order. And as I mentioned, space heaters, uh, because the thing with space heaters is they don't account for a lot of the heating fires, but if they do happen, they're particularly deadly, usually because somebody is so close to a space heater. Um, so making sure that they're um, at least three feet away from anything that can burn. And that means furniture or curtains or people. Um, shut them off at night when you go to bed. So pile up on the blankets, but turn the space heater off. Mm -hmm. And making sure that you have one that has some of those um, safety features like the automatic shut off. Um, mm -hmm. so the, and then I'll, we will be getting into the season where we're talking about Christmas trees and making sure they're well watered and taking them out when they're dry, because uh, the reality is, you know, every year we see tragedies occur from a, a very dry Christmas tree. If you think about that, that's, that's a lot of fuel in your home, um, should there be a fire. Mm -hmm. Well, and with the holidays too, you, we get a lot of travel, whether you're going to see family or friends or just taking a winter vacation. And that's yep. when you're staying somewhere else, you know, going back to the escape plan and even yep. knowing how to get out of a friend's house or a family member's house. is also Exactly. You know, t taking safety on the road, you know, no matter mm -hmm. where you're staying, looking around to see, does it have smoke alarms? Where are the exits? Hotels do a great job of putting those little maps on the back of the doors, but I don't know how many people actually look at them. If there's to a them. fire, which way am mm -hmm. I going if I have to go out this door? Yeah, awesome. definitely. 
Well, I know. We, yeah, I was just going to quickly wrap up. I mean, I know we could probably talk for a whole nother hour. There's so many different elements um, in escape planning um, and just fire prevention and safety in general. There's so many topics in there. But I just wanted to thank both of you for joining us um, and sharing all this great info. Um, and I just wanted to ask, how can listeners stay in touch with NFPA and Telgian? So, well, thank you for having us. I really appreciate it. And people can learn more about safety tips and get lots of resources at either nfpa.org, firepreventionweek.org, or sparky.org. Lots of uh, information that people can use to keep themselves safe. Yeah, same thing. I mean, you can go to telgen.org, or you can actually reach me, rlevitt, at telgen.org, or uh, excuse me, Telgen.com. <laughs> yeah, no. But uh, yeah, so uh, easy to reach. And um, uh, I do answer emails. That's what <laughs> said, uh, I said. I can attest to that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, once again, we want to thank you. And before we close out today, I do want to say a big thanks to our sponsor, Pritzker Hagman, uh, for their season one sponsorship. The Pritzker Hagman Burn Injury Legal Team helps burn survivors and their loved ones pursue compensation and justice throughout the United States. If you have any legal questions, our, the attorneys at Pritzker Hagman are ready to help. And you can find out more with them at legaljourney.guide. Uh, so I want to say thank you again to all of our friends today and uh, look out for, you know, all of the things happening during Fire Prevention Week, which will be next week. Thank you both for joining us today. Thanks, Ray. Thank you. I'm going to go practice. Thanks, yeah, good. There you go. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye-bye. Thanks so much for tuning in to this episode of Girls with Crafts. If you are enjoying this content, please feel free to rate, subscribe, and leave a review wherever you listen to your podcasts. This helps others find the show, and we greatly appreciate it. Thanks again for listening, and we'll catch you in the next episode.